Hello, 5.30 on a Wednesday. Welcome. It's time for my virtual Jericho this and every Wednesday afternoon. Um, a couple of commercials first off. Tomorrow at 4 o'clock, not 5.30 in the afternoon, uh, Trump looks as though he's going to lose. Do I hear cheers all around? And, uh, there's a spe special event with um, Ray Snoddy and called the Bonfire the, for the Vanities. Ray Snoddy, uh, uh, Professor John Curtis, Mark Thompson, former director general of the BBC, talking about populism and the demise of populism. Uh, you ha have to search under uh, Bonfire for the Vanities. Next week, we've, we've got a very special, another, uh, my Jericho, my Armistice Day. It's actually Armistice Day next week. It'll be Liz Wade, uh, a local local author, and, and the, author, the author of this very good book, 47 Men, on the First World War deaths in Jericho. And Dave Barson, who used to live in Cranham Terrace, talking about uh, Jericho in the Second World War. But uh, today, Mark Davis, who was a local historian, uh, uh, extraordinaire, uh, multi-published, he's an ex-canal dweller who now, now lives in, in Osney Mead. He's going to talk about a, a little scrapbook he's discovered. Over to you, Mark. Um, right, hello. Uh, thank you very much. Um, now, uh, I'm, yeah, excellent. So I'm relying on uh, remote control of uh, the slides that I'm going to show. And um, this is a, a collection that uh, this lady, uh, Miss Hawtrey, uh, collected and entered into a countywide scrapbook competition in uh, 1956. So um, I'm only going to cover uh, just a, a little snapshot, really, of uh, some of the entries. I think, uh, from my point of view, the most interesting aspect was the uh, oral histories. I'd already um, gleaned one or two uh, little quotes for one of my books uh, about the Oxford Canal. Um, but she, uh, but I hadn't had a chance to look at the um, scrapbook in any detail at that time. And, and indeed, I was really only looking for canal references, not for uh, wider Jericho. So uh, what you're looking at now, I hope, is uh, the way that she more or less divided up uh, the uh, scrapbook. Um, so begin at the beginning, um, as uh, Lewis Carroll once wrote. Um, here's just one uh, example of uh, Miss Hawtrey's narrative, essentially. Uh, it's curious how persistent was the tradition of that part of Jericho abutting the canal during the first 20 years of, or more of the 19th century. First a marsh and a refuge of footpads, and then to all intents and purposes a slum, through which Policemen preferred to walk in couples. Now, um, it occurs to me that uh, some people may not, uh, a lot of people, I hope, uh, are listening from Jericho. Uh, some of you may be from elsewhere and not especially familiar with the uh, geography of uh, Jericho. Now, I'm at a disadvantage now because I can't really point out things on this map, but hopefully you can see the, uh, the square-shaped uh, dark red a sort of middle uh, to the right, that's the University Press, Oxford University Press, which essentially is the catalyst for uh, the suburb of Jericho. And you can see that the housing is clustered around that uh, to the left and to the right. Uh, that's, that is the north and, uh, and west. Um, then, um, well, and the canal and uh, the branch of the River Thames is on the far left, and then you've got the railway, brand new, of course, in 1850, uh, to the left of that. Um, going back to, sorry, uh, just going back to uh, north or uh, above the, the the housing, you've got a, a patch of green, a rectangular patch of green. It's got St Paul's, uh, what's it say, St Paul's written across it. That's Jericho Gardens, and next, and uh, just. Adjacent to that is Jericho House, the public house, which uh, is the you know the, the origin of the name of the suburb. Okay, thank you. And there is uh, the earliest image I found of uh, that same Jericho house. So uh, I should point out none of these images are from within the scrapbook. That's I'm. I'm filching uh, different images just to illustrate what I'm saying uh, from elsewhere. 
Um, so again, it's that that continuing the previous quote, uh, infested with footpads and highwaymen. You know, this this bad reputation that uh, even in the 1950s people seemed to uh, suggest uh, Jericho had had from the very beginning. And Miss Hawtrey quotes there, uh, "The narrow, unmade lanes hillocked with clay." Uh, she doesn't acknowledge this, but she's actually quoting there from. Uh, that book uh, that I put at the bottom, Crips the Carrier, that's by R.D. Blackmore, uh, best known probably for his book about Lorna Doon. Um, but um, that again is a, is a quote from uh, the book, uh, the place was lonely, dark and villainous, footpads still abounded. She's, she's sort of uh, intermingling some, uh, some sort of, I don't know, some much later literature with uh, her oral memory. Uh, the reason, just before we move on from this then, uh, the reason I put Mr. Miller there uh, in 1956, he uh, is acknowledged by Miss Hawtrey as having uh, contributed some of the photographs that she has in her collection, in her scrapbook. Uh, he was at that time the landlord of the Jericho house, uh, a former Oxford male photographer, and I'm kind of hoping that this might just even jar or ring a few bells with people because maybe uh, Mr. Miller, whose first name I don't know, maybe he had many, many other photographs of Jericho uh, which would be really great to see. So if anybody, I'll give you my email at the end of this talk. If anybody has any information about that, uh, delighted to hear from you. Okay. Thank you. Next slide. All right. So, 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 so Mark, um, how did you come across this, um, this notebook? I was researching my book on the canal, so that would have been 1999 or something like that. Uh, and the film of it was 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 available at the Westgate Library at that time. Uh, so as I say, I was really only looking for canal references and had forgotten pretty much all about it until until recently, really. Uh, and, and has it ever seen the light of day apart from being in the library? Uh, not that I'm aware of, no, I think very few people, uh, I might be wrong, but uh, I get the impression that it's a, a little bit of a forgotten gem, really. Uh, so I haven't had a chance to analyse, you know, it's, it's difficult to to look through the whole thing, but I've picked out one or two things, which we'll come to shortly, so, uh, you know, uh, that I think if, are... If it's a gem, why doesn't somebody publish it? Are you going to plan to get, get it published? Uh, shh, it's a possibility. It's a possibility. There are many copyright issues. Many. <laughs> okay, move, move on if you would, please. Okay, so second section. She, she's clearly a religious uh, lady, um, uh, Miss Hawtrey, uh, and St Barnabas does dominate, you know, unsurprisingly. I think even uh, a sort of lay historian would, uh, would realise that the church is hugely significant to the suburb. Um, what's the, probably the earliest memoir that she has in her uh, scrapbook is from this chap, Montague Brown, because he had already, as you can see, he had already died uh, by some years when she compiled this, but she did have access to uh, his, his own sort of handwritten memoirs. So he uh, went to visit the, the church area uh, when it was being built, you know, so he, he became quite fascinated with the whole construction process. And I don't think there are any other uh, observations by anybody else uh, of that nature. Um, but again, you get this um, this warning about going to Jericho, this this very bad reputation that the suburb had uh, almost from uh, from the get go. Um, you know, that on no account were they to go at night, uh, for they would probably have rat's tails and oyster shells thrown at them. So deep seated was the general dis distrust of Jericho. That quote is one of the ones I used in my. Um, in my uh, towpath book, uh, towpath walk in Oxford, uh, co-written with Catherine Robinson, um, and there is the church. And um, I would just ask everybody uh, while we uh, debate or, or or await rather the verdict of the most recent planning application for this site, uh, that view down Cardigan Street, 
I am uh, the chair of the Jericho Living Heritage Trust and one of the uh, strongest points we made, uh, supported by all the other organisations, is just how important that view is. It's going to be lost absolutely completely with the, um, um, you know, with, with the over uh, enthusiasm, let's say, of the developers to put uh, more housing on that site than is possible, I believe. And you have that view straight up to the observatory. Uh, clearly designed by the original uh, town planners and the, st the street layout was clearly specifically done for that reason so that you had that wonderful view from the canal right up cardigan street to the observatory okay next slide um so the um other point that montague brown makes is that you know he's a young boy remember but he 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 was introduced because the workman became really sort of enamored of this this young lad who kept turning up and watching them build and ask the questions and so on and as a consequence he was in, he was uh, you know invited to meet uh, Thomas Coombe himself the uh, the main man if you like of the uh, building of the church he paid for it as you are probably aware and um, just as a, uh, a curiosity, really, you will see that that photograph was taken by uh, somebody called Charles Dodson, uh, better known, of course, as Lewis Carroll. And I'm not going to let this opportunity uh, slip by without uh, encouraging uh, or uh, emphasizing uh, to anybody listening my interest in that particular topic, because it, he, Carol does uh, infiltrate in, 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 in various different ways into the uh, history of Jericho and St Barnabas and Thomas Coombe. Okay, next. Uh, so this is a uh, so t the Coombe. Uh, so let's just wait for it to focus. So uh, this is this is indeed uh, the only uh, plan or the only uh, example of um, uh, an insert in the in the scrapbook uh, which I'm showing you um, because I already had this. She she she's. Miss Hawtrey copied it from elsewhere. The original is at the Warwick Record Office, as you can see, uh, which is where the Oxford Canal uh, records uh, archives are mainly held. So it shows the church, uh, paid for by Thomas Coombe, but the land was donated by uh, the Ward family. And uh, the yellow and the and the pink land is what we are, you know, sort of fighting for still uh, to this day. Uh, it belonged, the land belonged to three different brothers and it's George Ward, who uh, the, the, the history is muddled here because a lot of accounts say it was William Ward that provided the land. Uh, within the scrapbook is, uh, uh, is, is several references to George Ward. So um, that's interesting to me and um, that deserves further investigation. Um, right, next. Uh, don't know what uh, George or Henry Ward looked like, but uh, uh, the eldest brother of a very large family, William Ward, uh, we do know because he became a mayor, uh, a great philanthropist as well. Uh, he, it was also who was in control of that boat building yard, which is up at Walton Well Road. That's uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a very clear image, I think, but um, you can perhaps see right in the distance uh, a lift bridge before the current uh, brick bridge, which takes you, you know, down to Port Meadow and so on. So the wards were the instigators of a Jericho boat building uh, firm and uh, we hope to sustain that as uh, part of the new development. Uh, a boat building and boat repair centre is of course uh, an integral part of that and the wards, um, yeah, so following in the wards fine uh, footsteps perhaps. Okay. Okay. Um, Go on, carry on, please. Yeah, I mean there will be there will be. I'm going to do finish this the church bit and then then stop. Okay. Um, uh, another well, uh, another um, thing which uh, which I hadn't seen before, but which is in the scrapbook, which is uh, a notice inviting people to come to uh, this particular meeting at uh, the town hall where John Betjeman was chairing a meeting to try and save the canal essentially because after the second world war uh, there was a lot of doubt about the utility of canals all over the country 
Um, and the scrapbook was published, of course, just, well, she was co collecting it exactly as this meeting occurred. So uh, that's quite interesting. There's no further comment about it, but um, it was successful, I think, is what we would say. Uh, Betjeman did, he loved Jericho. He wrote uh, a poem about St. Barnabas and so on. Um, yes, uh, next. Um, now this this is a, is an interesting a little excerpt I think another oral history from uh, somebody called Aunt Mary uh, I don't know any more than that uh, the image you're seeing is the interior of St Barnabas and um, uh, it's well known that men and women sat on separate sides uh, I say it's well known I just hear that from vicars and from uh, church wardens and so on. I don't believe I've ever seen it written down, but there it is uh, quite clearly. Aunt Mary is remembering uh, when the pulpit was on the left-hand side, as we look at it down towards the altar uh, uh, of the middle eyes where the ladies sat. Uh, and on the consecration day, the 19th of October, 1869, uh, she could hear, this is Bishop uh, Wilberforce, Wilberforce uh, the Oxford Bishop of Oxford. Uh, he came to preach that day, uh, but then she complains that once they moved the pulpit to the other side, then uh, she couldn't hear so well. The acoustics are not great in St Barnabas, as anybody who sat in there uh, will know. Uh, the pulpit, which I didn't know, was in the memory of uh, Mrs Coombe. So Thomas, you know, provided the, the, the funding, but then Martha Coombe, who I think deserves a much greater credit than she perhaps gets in uh, various accounts of Jericho. Um, there's a nice little quote from William Holman Hunt, one of the pre-Raphaelite artists that um, Thomas Coombe was uh, particularly enamoured of. He was a great patron of the pre-Raphaelites. So in his um, biography, he writes that Mrs Coombe was the foster mother of the whole parish. She knew the troubles of every house and left neither good, bad, nor indifferent without her solid sympathy. Okay, next one. Um, yeah, so uh, I think this is just to conclude uh, the St Barnabas section um, that uh, uh, Thomas Coombe uh, died before his wife, um, and again, uh, this 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 image was created in uh, 1872, the year of his death, uh, in honour of him. And indeed, William Ward, the, the boat you won't be able to see, but the boat there in this image uh, has W. Ward uh, on the side of it. And again, let me emphasise that that wonderful view up. St. Bar St. Uh, sorry, Cardigan Street uh, towards the Radcliffe Observatory and there, so just to remind uh, uh, myself really, uh, just to put, oh yes, I know, I wanted to just say, uh, Living Heritage Trust uh, for Jericho, uh, we are about to lose two trustees and so I'm sort of just take this opportunity uh, just to mention that. Again, you can see my email at the end of this talk. Uh, should you uh, be interested to uh, help us try and sustain uh, the, the varied history of Jericho, especially once the new development takes place, then uh, I'd be very pleased to hear from you. Okay, next. Mark, why, Mark, why did why did Thomas Coombe build the church and why did he build it so splendidly? Well, he did, you, you think that's splendid, that's plain. He, 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 you remember the instructions that he gave were that, that it should be extremely plain on the outside and no, uh, no excess uh, expenditure, no extravagance should be, um, should be uh, expended. Um, he, he modelled it, he wanted it modelled on uh, uh, the cathedral in Torcello which I think he had seen, but I don't know if there's absolute proof of that. Um, so that was it. However, the inside, as you will also be aware, is, 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 is very grand and is very uh, impressive. Uh, so it's, 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 two, it's, a, it's two churches in one almost, you might think. Is it, whose money was it? Uh, well, it, it was his. It was his. It was you know he earned it as the uh, superintendent of the Oxford University Press. Uh, he was on a good salary. Uh, he was quite a, an astute businessman as well, and um, he had he and Martha had no children. So um, that's essentially, I think, why why his philanthropy. What you know that quote about from Holman Hunt about her being the foster mother of the whole parish. Uh, you know that has a, a sort of slight biological uh, uh, reference there as well. Um, 
and there was you know the suburb was growing while while Co while the Coombs were in Jericho and the existing church of St Paul's which is now Freud's uh, the wine bar was not of sufficient size so he I think he saw it as his his role actually uh, as a Jericho resident to uh, provide this much bigger grander church and Martha Coombe of course has a blue plaque on the side of the church if any if people don't know in, in Cardigan Street uh, questions always intrigue me why is only one side of the wall have a freeze and the other side doesn't do they run out of money uh, yeah, I was kind of hoping that Miss Hawtrey might have shed a bit of light on that, but I couldn't see that she did, sadly. So, yeah, I mean, essentially, I think uh, that is that is the answer. It was um, it was done at the beginning of the, um, uh, the the 20th century, and I think the First World War got in the way. Really, that's that's my conclusion. If, um, if anybody has not been to St Barnabas who is watching this, do go. It is an absolutely splendid church, even for old atheists like me. It's a, a, and, and do go to a service with the bells, bells and smells. Do you want to move on, Mark? Okay. Nice poster, by the way. Yes, it is, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, so um, she spends a, a little bit of time talking about the different schools. I, I, that's an aspect of Jericho history that hasn't really crossed my radar. I haven't um, looked into it particularly. Uh, those of you who know me will know that the waterways, the river and the canal are my my sort of main interests really uh, so uh, these two quotes i thought were quite interesting uh, to pick up on the fact that um, these working class kids who probably didn't get very many treats uh, in a you know a slightly you know, a, a slightly um I don't know how to phrase this delicately, but uh, you know it would have been a damp uh, location, especially further down. If you live down towards the canal, you know, subject to flooding and so on, uh, small houses. <clears throat> You know, fairly insanitary. I mean, Jericho uh, was indeed uh, a place where uh, cholera and smallpox uh, were quite prevalent quite early on. So uh, not the healthiest of suburbs. So to get this treat must have been absolutely sensational for them. And, uh, you know, it, the, there are just two quotes from people uh, recalling uh, quite some time earlier uh, these trips that were uh, a real special treat for them. Um, don't think, yes, yeah, so uh, that's the quotes on the left-hand side. The quote on the right-hand side, yep. Was the, was the drum and pipe band, was that allied to the church? Was that uh, was it, from, was it uh, the pipe band, was it, uh, was that, did that come out of the church? I think, I think so, because I think, I think, Earlier on in, in that first quote, I think she does say, uh, say that they uh, they assembled at the church, and then the, but it was a school, but it, uh, it is the school drum and fife band. So I mean, it's the kids doing it, which must have been also been great fun. You would have thought. Um, yeah, did that answer the, answer the question? Yes, it did. Anyway, uh, right. Okay. So uh, now uh, my. Um, uh, I, I'm not in, I'm not in control of the, the the way the images are are behaving now, but I was going to tease you a little bit by saying that uh, the, the quote on the right hand side was not uh, by uh, a child from Jericho. In fact, somebody very very different. So yes, you can move on now, Phil. Um, uh, that quote is from this young lady who is uh, Alice Little. Um, so she and, and i think that's rather rather splendid that uh, you know these these working class kids from jericho were getting the same kind of uh, excitement really that a, a very privileged young lady like uh, alice little the daughter of the dean of christ church and of course the model for alice's adventures in wonderland uh, you know she went there on many occasions uh, earlier on you know quite, uh, in the 1850s and 1860s so it took, uh, at that time i'm sure the uh, you know she wouldn't have been uh, rubbing shoulders with the kids from Jericho but uh, moving on you know in the century uh, a little bit then uh, the Harcourt family who owned Noonan seemed to have opened it up and been quite um, you know quite uh, broad-minded uh, if you like in that respect uh, okay thanks 
And so, as I say, I'm not going to let this uh, this marketing opportunity uh, pass me by because John doesn't either. Uh, those of you who don't know, uh, my book Alice in Mortalland does look at all of these kind of uh, river associations, the way that the River Thames has uh, influenced this story of Alice. And it's just a viable for me to mention this, of course, because it, it is an Oxford, sorry, a Jericho uh, book, if you like. You know, the very first edition was uh, published uh, under. Thomas Coombe supervision uh, at the University Press. So, uh, you know, there's, um, it gives, you know, that gives the, 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 the suburb uh, uh, certainly a bit of uh, extra kudos, I think. Okay, thanks. How do people get hold of that, Mark? Uh, my, my, my book, uh, well, I'll, I'll uh, give my website and my email address at the end because, yes, of course, I mean, the, you know, the bookshops. To coincidentally as we speak of course uh, no chance at all to get one at a bookshop now uh, even if you rushed out uh, tomorrow uh, so it is really uh, via me I think okay and how much and uh, how much does it cost uh, it retails that one retails at 12 pounds a very good reason is to okay um, so move on if you can to, to the next bit of the scrapbook Yeah, so this is a broad, she did she use that expression, looking back, um, it's a bit of a broad brush um, uh, way, she, she does sort of further divide it in the scrapbook, uh, but I've just sort of combined one or two uh, different quotes from uh, from different, again, from these, these elderly uh, Jericho residents, uh, looking back at their childhood, really, and again, it's Canal, uh, which sort of uh, dominates my my attention and my interest in particular uh, in what people are saying. Uh, she never reveals her sources, you know, as a, like, like journalists don't. Uh, the initial, so always only the initials of the individuals who are uh, giving these quotes rather than the full name that she gives. Um, so at the bottom of their garden, so this is in Ferry, yes, they, they, yes they've moved to Ferry Road, uh, which is now Coombe Road, of course, just running down to the canal, you, you, you just, just off to the left of the image that you're looking at. Uh, so at the bottom of the garden was the house where the tolls were paid, um, so that would be the, the house that's just um, sort of partially shown in that illustration there, barges went up and down continually, slightly have to be pernickety about this. They were narrow boats, not barges, because uh, the Oxford Canal was not uh, wide enough to take barges uh, by that time, uh, except at the very beginning. Anyway, uh, that's by the by. Uh, blah, 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 uh, blah. Donkeys, yes, uh, still being uh, drawn by uh, probably a mule rather than a donkey, the very last uh, uh, narrow boat to be pulled by an animal. By a draft animal was a, a mule that was by uh, Joe uh, Joe Skinner was his name. We know quite a lot about him, and that was in the 1950s. So that was you know that was still happening even as Miss Poultry was uh, putting her uh, little collection of memoirs together. Um, blah blah blah. There was a ferry, so that's what why, you're looking why, at. Why did people Why did people want to cross the canal? Where were they coming going to and from? Uh, well, by that time, the railway station, I suppose, and the school, uh, and the bathing place at Tumbling Bay, um, that was essentially for the, the kids needed to get across to go for their swimming lessons. Uh, in fact, they would take two ferries, because, uh, of course, you had to take a ferry across the River Thames once you've gone past. But then I think it was access to the railway station, wasn't it? That would have been the, uh, the obvious uh, need for most people going in that direction. Because we know, you know, the Mount Place footbridge was clearly not there. So it's quite a long walk in, a, in either direction down to Hythe Bridge Street if you wanted to get west or up to Walton Well if you wanted to go uh, in that direction. And the Herberts, well, I've, I've highlighted Mr. and Mrs. Herbert because uh, William Herbert comes into the story uh, in the last section that I'm going to talk about, which will be the, uh, uh, the infamous tallow factory uh, uh, down by the canal. Was, was, okay. it, was that a private ferry? Do they make money out of it? Yes, uh, yes. Uh, does it not say yes? So you, you have to pay. Yeah. So she had to pay a halfpenny, as you can see from yeah. the quote. 
uh, yeah, so he it was a little bit of extra income for uh, for him. He was a coal merchant as well. He had a a role with the uh, canal company as well. I think probably it says the tolls were paid. You know, boats did uh, did have you know the boats were being run commercially, and so they would pay uh, tolls as they passed. And um, but yeah, so you you made you know in that kind of permission position you would try and make uh, as much income as you could from different aspects but it looks like it could be done uh, by the individual herself and that would solve our problem wouldn't it if we could have a, a self-operated ferry today uh, rather than uh, the bridge that's causing such a lot of issues uh, ho -hum. Mm. Uh, move on okay. yeah Um, so again, you probably can't make up out um, uh, the detail of this map, but um, uh, what, this is um, a drink map that was done in the 1880s, the whole of Oxford, and it uh, identified the public houses, the, uh, the ale houses, and the, uh, the inns and so on. And um, well, you, perhaps you can just get the impression of just how many there were in Jericho. It did have uh, quite a reputation for having um, uh, somewhere you know, somewhere you could buy alcohol on, on virtually every corner, and you can see that's not too far from the truth, actually. Uh, when you look at all those little red dots there, um, and although Mr. B, uh, who was born in 1874, um, he quotes uh, the vicar, uh, an earlier vicar, saying um, that when he came to Jericho, he was you know, surprised by just how many old people there were there, uh, you know, in contradiction to what I've just was saying a little bit earlier about uh, it being rather, an, presumably, actually, really rather an unhealthy uh, place to live. Uh, you know, there would have been lots of smoke from chimneys uh, because coal would have been actually one of the things you could easily get in Jericho, which you wouldn't necessarily in other suburbs because it was there, you know, actually on your doorstep because of the canal, uh, rather damp and so on. But anyway, uh, his conclusion, the vicar uh, at that time, uh, was that it was the fresh air from Whiteham and Hinksey. Uh, now, that sort of just, when I read that, I thought, well, that is interesting, actually, because Jericho... Um, Oxford's first planned suburb, I would suggest to you, uh, is on the west of the city. And uh, normally, that's not normal. You know, most cities, the poorer parts are on the east, where uh, the prevailing westerly winds will blow all of the, the horrible uh, smoke uh, away from, you know, in that direction. Whereas Jericho actually is quite <laughs> quite well placed. And St Thomas has come to that. Uh, just a quirk of geography, uh, that is. But it's quite interesting in a way. Um, so if we go to the next one, uh, again, I can't resist making uh, another uh, Lewis Carroll uh, association because uh, it's my theory uh, that uh, when in the Garden of Live Flowers, uh, the rose says um, about the way that the, uh, the Red Queen grow so quickly he says it's the fresh air that does it uh, wonderfully fine air it is out here now i think that i my suggestion is that that actually refers to binsey uh, we talked about whiteham and hinksey there these are all places to the west you know across port meadow uh, uh, where the air will be coming uh, across to jericho uh, because uh, the red queen uh, who was really mary prickett uh, there is a a bit of an association with her and binsey so this is my theory anyway that uh, that fresh air quote uh, can be applied to binsey and therefore uh, you know if that whiteham and hinksey quote is correct then uh, that's the air that uh, jericho was getting the benefit of very simple question. Why are so many pubs? Phew. Water, you know, I suppose, you know, it's, it, it's safer than water, wasn't it, for such a long time? Uh, not by the time you get to the 1880s, but uh, I suppose the tradition had been established. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, other people may have, have a, a, a better it, idea. Well, there couldn't have been enough, enough of a clientele for all those pubs. People must have come into them from outside. Well, yes, that's interesting, isn't it? Good question, John. Um, I'm not. I'm not quite sure. Um, I wouldn't have. You know, Jericho had a bad reputation. I'm not sure that lots of people would have flocked in, even at that time. Um, uh, there wasn't that much entertainment, and and if you were, you know, if you were a working man that had been, you know, working from dawn till dusk, I suppose, you know, there were a lot, lot more people that wanted to uh, just have a beer, uh, just to wind down. 
uh, rather than drink at home. And some of these are just ale houses, you know, they're just private houses that uh, are brewing on the premises, essentially. They're not all, you know, big public houses by any means. Okay, next, next slide. Ah, this is the tallow factory. Uh, yes, so that will be the uh, the final section where I'll just give a, a brief rundown of uh, what I found out about it. Uh, and there is uh, the quote from uh, Miss Hortree, um, who, uh, with the you know the charm of um, people getting on a bit, describes all of the people she's interviewed as old. But she was uh, what well, she was <laughs> well into her seventies herself. Uh, but all these old people whose memory stretches back back some way some some way back to appreciate with one accord is a tallow factory, which used to exist at the end of Canal Street. So that. Ordnance survey map that you that you are looking at now. Well, you can see the tallow factory very clearly indicated there in that 1899 uh, map. Um, they all agreed it smelt to high heaven, and uh, yeah, it's quite quite a nice you know fish. Uh, small boys uh, fishing in the canal. Uh, yeah, you can imagine that they would have uh, got a lot of joy out of uh, getting maggots for free. Uh, and what, I guess that was a what, what, what's tallow. Will explain to people who don't know what what is tallow. Um, well, um, I, I can't say I know exactly, but it's I mean it's 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 animal fat. It's it's a, a byproduct of um, the meat industry, as you'll find out shortly, uh, and used in soap and candles. So hugely important, you know, and very much in demand uh, for those two products. And it was, but it was a, a side product of a of a. Uh, an abattoir essentially and a uh, which is in park end street so we'll come to that uh, uh, shortly uh so just again for those of you who aren't from jericho uh if you look at that map you've got some barnabas church that we've talked about a lot uh, down the bottom which is also adjacent to canal street then canal street running uh, to the north straight up to uh, where the uh, the tallow factory is and, and that map does show the ferry as well so you can get your bearings there the, the the image of the ferry that i showed a couple of slides back that's also shown there on that ordnance survey map okay next slide oh okay the tallow factory is what's there now well i will we'll come to that john uh, i haven't done my tallow factory section yet uh, that okay. was just uh, in case you wanted to ask about the what was the, the schools really. Uh, we've just finished the school section. We finished with Miss Hawtrey's scrapbook now. Uh, her quote there about the tallow factory just got me interested in it. And um, so uh, the last few slides will just be uh, about that. But if you wanted to ask anything about the schools, no, no, not no, that no, I. Can, 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 plow, plow on. So it was interesting there was a building yard where 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 where, where, where the court is now. Yes, yeah, that's right, yes. Uh, timber yard, yeah. Yeah, I mean it was you know, that was Jericho. It was, it was all sorts of uh, industrial processes going on, little um shops and so on on the, the high street. Uh, sorry, in the every corner really as well, as well as uh, pubs, you know. So people worked uh, probably close to their lots, home lots, a lot of lots of garages as well, weren't there? Lots of repair yeah. garages and things. Yeah, yeah, it was an artisans. Yeah, it's full of art, full of artisans doing their doing their thing. I think. Um, so, uh, what's what's good about having looked into the tallow factory is that it um, it's sort of it's highlighted to me uh, not quite the very earliest reference I found to Canal Street, uh, but almost, and it was through this adver advert in uh, Jackson's Oxford Journal. Um, those of you who uh, you know, uh, who, who, who perhaps aren't familiar with Jackson's, it is such a, a, a gold mine really for local historians going way back to 1753, which was when the first issue of this weekly newspaper uh, came out. Uh, you know, it's it's such a um, such a boon really for local historians to have uh, a newspaper of that sort, giving not a lot of local history to be fair, but uh, enough to to keep you uh, keep you interested and uh, a very large number of advertisements like this one. So what it's saying is uh, there you are. So this byproduct of uh, the hide skin and fat market in Park End Street and Canal Street. So that's the that's the point. So the Canal Street reference there is clearly the tallow factory. It's the earliest reference I've found to it, 1869, uh, and the name at the bottom there, uh, C J Harrison. 
So uh, what I've done is looked in a little bit into uh, Harrison's background. Uh, okay, so next. Um, so CJ becomes Charles James. Um, in uh, uh, and it's it, it, clearly it's associated with him uh, right from the 1860s. I think he must have established it. I can't find an exact uh, start date, but you know that's probably close enough or as close as we'll get. Um, in the 1881 and 1891 censuses, it's described simply as Tallow House, and uh, the man uh, who was resident there is William Herbert. Now, uh, as a tell now Herbert is clearly the same man who uh, in was the ferryman later on in that lady's memoir, because in the 1901 census, he has moved from the tallow factory to uh, live at Far Ferry House. And he might well be that man, even in that image that I showed you a bit earlier, the man that was um, uh, punting the ferry across. Um, but then uh, Harrison then uh, later on took on a partner and by uh, 1892, as you can see, again, Jackson's Oxford Journal is the source for this. Uh, the firm has become known as Harrison and Lucas Limited. Uh, so by this time, still the telefactory is ongoing and it's referred to as belonging or being run by Harrison and Lucas uh, from that point onwards. I'm grateful to uh, Liz Woolley, uh, a wonderful uh, local historian who many people will, I'm sure, know, uh, because I asked her, she's very interested in industrial archaeology and history uh, more so than I, and so I asked her uh, what she knew about the Park End, um, uh, Harrison and Lucas's stuff, and she put, because I didn't, I couldn't track Lucas down, but she put me on to him uh, as being, uh, and via uh, her equivalent to Liz Wade's book that you mentioned earlier, John. So Liz is the author of 66 Men of Grandpont. These are uh, men from Grandpont who died in the First World War and uh, the son of uh, John Butler Lucas, who is the Lucas of Harrison and Lucas. Uh, he is one of those uh, 66 men. Uh, okay, next. And Harrison uh, himself did pretty well for himself. He, um, so I'm just checking uh, my, right. Uh, yeah, so uh, he is the person who commissioned this house. Uh, it's the West Oxford Democrats Club now uh, on East Street in Osney. Uh, it's handily, it's got the date of 1881 uh, on it. And I had a suspicion it was his. So he, he did pretty well for himself, I would say. And um, if we go to the next one, um, I couldn't resist thrusting this in, given where we are, and with all uh, ears and eyes uh, focused on America with this little uh, um, cartoon. Uh, it's a bit of a stereotypical uh, idea of uh, Americans and their um, sort of um, uh, their, their, their sort of penchant for uh, rushing around places and thinking they've done the whole of Europe in a week and that sort of thing. So I don't know if you can make out the uh, the caption or not, but uh, the younger woman is saying, uh, do you reckon, no, the older woman is saying, do you reckon this car will put us down at the famous Oxford University? And the other one is saying, hustle round, Ma, our train leaves for Stratford in 30 minutes. Uh, it was having a little joke at, at, at their express, uh, at, at uh, Americans expense. However, the reason that I've put that in there is because um, uh, Charles James Harrison was rather interesting in that in 1869, um, he somehow or other allowed uh, another individual to be in debt to him to well over a thousand pounds. It's an extraordinary amount of money. And he went to a very great extent to get his money back. Uh, the extent was to go all the way to Michigan uh, in America uh, with uh, um, a policeman uh, much, I'm sure, to the surprise of the guy who had absconded from, I can't remember where it was now, it was Suffolk. He, he, he thought he, you know, he'd gone to Suffolk and then he, he scarpered to uh, America thinking he was probably safe, I imagine. But Harrison was not a man to uh, allow a, a debt of that nature uh, escape him and um, he got his money back essentially. So I thought that was quite uh, amusing. Okay, uh, next. Um, the infamous tallow factory, so bear in mind it belongs to Harrison and Lucas uh, at this point. And uh, feeling was running so high in Jericho that um, they, a petition was, uh, was initiated. 
uh, for many. So what it, what the petition, this was a petition presented to the council. So the, the paperwork for this does uh, exist uh, at the Oxford History Centre. Uh, so I just wanted to check to see, I was hoping it might mention there exactly when the uh, telefactory uh, opened, but it didn't. Uh, all it said was, uh, again, a uh, rather interesting uh, angle on Jericho people. It says um, outbursts of feeling had been um, uh, uh, have been prevalent for uh, many years about this abominable nuisance. Uh, unhealthy neighbourhood, uh, they talk about there, a floating population, uh, and only those who are obliged uh, to, uh, only those who are obliged to, remaining at any length of time, uh, together with those who have lost all sense of smell. Uh, as the compulsory removal of pigs from this densely populated district was affected uh, recently, I think is the implication, we implore you to remove this still greater nuisance without delay. You know, that was a little detail that uh, I wasn't aware of, I'm sure, I haven't, perhaps other historians are, but uh, the fact that pigs had to be uh, were, were sort of banished from Jericho uh, shortly before 1899. It's just a, a little bit of an aside, and, sh and clearly it shows that you know a little bit of market gardening and so on. People were, you know, were, were yeah, people were rearing their own animals in the backyards, presumably uh, right up until that time. Um, I couldn't find a, an image of the canal at this time, so I've. I've slotted in Valerie Pett's wonderful uh, image of St Barnabas because in, in essence I think even though she did that uh, in 2003 if we go back a hundred years that sort of view uh, probably could still have been seen to some extent and the tallow factory itself is uh, just in the distance just a bit, little bit further down the canal um, which is um, we will see uh, today how it looks in the next slide Um, again, uh, thank you to Valerie for uh, that photograph uh, taken early uh, one recent morning, uh, recently furbished uh, by the council. Uh, it is the entry point to uh, Jericho and it is essentially the only open space. This again is why uh, this development on the boatyard site is so critical really. Uh, the, the 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 need for a, 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 an open space, a square uh, worthy of the name. Uh, becomes, you know, absolutely central to the demands that we have for that site. Uh, you know, people who, again, people who are not aware, uh, a boatyard, a community centre, uh, housing and a, a public open space have to be all incorporated into that location. Currently, uh, this is the only location in Jericho that one can call uh, a public open space, really. Um, and that is where the... Can you place that, Mark? Would you say where it is? Because people may not know. That's where the tallow factory was. Yeah, that's yeah. Sorry, that's uh, that's where I was going on to say. Yeah, uh, so that is exactly where uh, the tallow factory that you've seen on the Ordnance Survey map. So Canal Street is down, yeah, ending, and if you if you go to, down to the right from this image, that's where Canal Street is. Uh, and interesting, the wall you can still see uh, to the left. The wall uh, does still have bricked in windows. You know that presumably is essentially still at that same wall because I'm not aware of any other structure uh, coming, you know, replacing the tallow factory, which um, the last reference I've got is, I think is in 1911. Um, if we go on to the next image, please. It's not quite Mount Place, I think, but it possibly could be. Uh, and Coincidentally, from 1955, this sketch from the uh, the Oxford Times, but you can see the old Lucy's building in the background there. Uh, that's uh, one which I found extremely ugly, but I'm surprised to find lots of people seem to quite like, really. Uh, but then I think I think somewhere within, certainly the, these buildings must have been adjacent to the old tallow factory, even if that's not exactly them and they must have been contemporary with part of it uh, it's the closest I've got and again I would put out an appeal to anybody uh, who's got Jericho connections and very you know, old photos perhaps you know it would be rather fun to get hold of a actual photograph of the tallow factory of that building unfortunately people didn't tend to take photos of industrial buildings did they in the past but actually in many ways they are uh, the most interesting to uh, local historians okay so next Next one. Uh, yeah, so this is this is this is my final slide. Essentially, um, I've we've done that in forty-five minutes. Break. 
Yeah. Uh, it's not really a break, is it? Well, I mean, it could be, but uh, so you did ask, uh, we'll leave that up a little bit so that people can rush and get their pens uh, and write down uh, the email. I, I mean, if you're interested in any of these books, the, the Towpath Walk in Oxford one, many people will have all of these books, I'm sure, already, uh, but that's the one that I have quoted from Miss Hawtrey's scrapbook uh, once or twice. Uh, the Waterland book we've talked about a little bit, and uh, my most recent uh, creation is a revised edition of Stories of Oxford Castle, which has a, a very strong uh, canal connection, not so much Jericho itself, but certainly uh, there's a lot about the canal uh, in that particular book. And again, if anybody uh, would like to know more about the Jericho Living Heritage Trust, as I say, we are looking to get one or two uh, new trustees as we lose two stalwart uh, servants of the trust, uh, then do uh, just drop me a line on that email. Okay. Um, leave that up for a while if you can, Phil. And if, you, if you've if you missed that, uh, th those addresses, this, this is recorded on YouTube and is there for posterity. So you can go back and you can find those addresses, but it's mark.oxhist at gmail.com or www.oxfordwaterwalks.com .co.uk um, and uh, these books are all available there and, and, and to buy. Now, Mark, I'll find a couple of questions to you. Um, what, how fascinating do you find Jericho? What, what, what is the fascination for you? Um, the canal, first and foremost, of course because uh, I have been a narrowboat dweller for uh, 28 years. Uh, still available, incidentally, if anybody's destined to... So you £85,000, correct? Central Oxford home, yes, it's reduced for a bargain, 75,000. Uh, yeah, I mean, it is a, a, an absolutely glorious location. I think I've been caught by COVID a little bit, unfortunately, but there you are. Um, um, yeah, so the canal, first and foremost, but then also it is this idea of this first planned suburb. You know, it is on a grid pattern. Uh, you know, there are much older suburbs in Jer uh, in Oxford, of course, you know, St. Thomas's, St. Ebbs, St. Aldate's, uh, St. Clement's, even if you want to include that. But Jericho was open fields it didn't grow organically it was just created it was designed and i'll go back again to that point about cardigan street and that wonderful view uh, that we you know that we're going to lose sadly i'm afraid uh because of the um it will get blocked off uh, and even if you can't see all the way up to the observatory it, it kind of opens it, it opens up the suburb uh to welcome people I, I now live, if I can just dwell on that, I now live close to Osney. And if you walk, if you drive or walk past Osney, um, Bridge Street, the central one, uh, it, it, it invites you into the suburb. You know, it hasn't been blocked off. You you, you know, you feel like you, you want to go in there. And I think that's what uh, that view uh, along Cardigan Street would do uh, for our new but, development. And I really, really hope we can save it. was a which was set up for workers, though, wasn't it? It wasn't, it, 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 North Oxford was, was the bourgeoisie, but... Um, Jericho were, were, were workers essentially. Am I correct in yeah. thinking that? The British? Yes. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yes. These these were fairly cheap. I mean, workers at the press to some extent, of course. I mean, and, and the press still owns quite a lot of uh, those houses up close to it. But it was an opportunity for um, developers, if you like, you know, private prospectors to buy up the land. They, 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 lots of plots were auctioned in uh, 1828 was the earliest uh, when lots of those, those meadow plots were uh, auctioned and individuals could buy them. Quite a few individuals bought quite a lot of them and then sold them on or rented them out. But yes, I, to be honest, I haven't done a detailed study of the, um, of the but, occupations of people. But whole, whole blocks of, of Jericho are owned by colleges and, and, and Lucy's, for example, bought the whole of Jackson Street. And the reason they did that was so people wouldn't complain about their lorries coming down Jackson Street. So they, uh -huh. they owned all the houses. So, I mean, it, that sits in John owns quite a lot. You know, I think Worcester probably owns Nelson, quite a lot on Nelson Street. So it's, it's fascinating, all of that. Um, how can people help you as a local historian? What would you like them to do? Apart from buy your well, books? Uh, yeah, um, well, the, photo, the photos. I mean, I, I think that's, that's intriguing me slightly. Um, uh, that's there were some photos that were contemporary that had been taken by that chap, uh, Mr. Miller. Uh, I know nothing about him. I haven't had a chance to look into that. Uh, but if, you know, Jericho tends to have family, you know, it does tend to have quite a lot of people who have been here and whose parents have been here and even their grandparents. That's, that's changing, of course. But uh, people, 
listening to this might have moved out of Jericho and know or have some uh, inkling how to uh, whether there are more photos that Miller took of uh, Jericho. And the other thing is Miss Hawtrey herself. You know, she's a little bit of a mystery, to be honest. Uh, and I'm kind of hoping that, you know, maybe somebody's mother's or grandmother's letters, you know, there's some mention of her. Uh, that would be great. Those are the two things that I would quite like to pursue in this particular context. You were, you were a bit coy earlier on about publishing the book. I mean, have you thought of doing it with the JCA or something like that as a sort of special Jericho edition? Of the notebook, yeah, I, I, I have I have thought about it. Uh, <laughs> I'll say no more than that. As I say, I, the, 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 it's like it's there's a there's a there's a copyright. There, the potentially there are there may be copyright issues. I'm sure there they can be overcome, uh, but I don't know if I have um, my mind in that direction just yet. But okay. it would be great. Oh, 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 but thank you. That's been a sort of fascinating fifty minutes. Um, just to, in terms of, of commercial breaks, you mentioned 47 men. Here it is. Next week, next Wednesday at 5.30, Liz Wade will talk about uh, people from Jericho who died in World War World War One, and, and, and Dave Barson will talk about life in World War Two in Jericho. And just to, uh, at 4 o'clock uh, about Trump, Boris, and populism. Have we seen the end of it? Uh, that's at 4 o'clock on, on YouTube. You have to uh, type in Bonfire Night for the of the Vanities to find it. That should be um, very very interesting and entertaining. It has a star cast. And um, finally, let's um, take you back to what Jericho used to be like with some nice old film of it. Thank you very much indeed, Mark. Okay, thanks.